presentation today. It's the first time we're ever having a presentation on podiatry uh, today, so we are grateful for it. And it's uh, even interesting that at the end of Women's Month, we are having two women, uh, two black women to present. So this is also historic that we have been two of our doctors who are here to present at the end of uh, March, which is uh, a Women's Month. So we are grateful for that. We want to give God thanks and praise for the opportunity. And we are in for a great, great time of knowledge, insight, and wisdom, and some very practical ways that we can all take care of the feet. The reality is that we spend a lot of time on, on, on these two uh, uh, things we call feet uh, here. A lot of time, and sometimes we don't give it the attention it deserves, and so we're going to journey together today. Uh, Dr. Monica Joseph is here, and Dr. Uh, Adams is here, and opening prayer. I will turn it over to them, and they will get, take us on this journey of a lifetime. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you always. You're the creator and the maker of all things. So we thank you for the gift of knowledge and insight and wisdom, understanding. And as we engage now around the world in this conversation, we pray that your wisdom, the, the insight we'll gain, be able to materialize in the way that we can talk, talk and take care of these bodies that you have given to us. We give you all the honor and all the praise, and God's people say, Amen and amen. Thank you, Dr. Neil, for such a warm and gracious introduction. I want to take this time to also thank you all that are in person for attending our presentation. And those of you out in Zoom, thank you also for tuning in. Uh, I would like to introduce myself before we begin our presentation. My name is Dr. Monica Joseph. I am owner and founder of Millennial Foot Care. I have two locations here in Brooklyn, New York. I've been in practice now for 30 years. I received my bachelor's degree from Stony Brook University, my medical degree from Temple University, and I did my residency training in Detroit, Michigan. I am really honored to be sharing this podium this morning with my colleague. She's an amazing professional woman, and she, her name is Dr. Cerise Adams, and she will now take the time to introduce herself before we begin our presentation, Dr. Adams. Thank you, Dr. Joseph, for that introduction. Good morning, my name is Dr. Adams. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I attended Fordham University for college, and then I also matriculated into Temple University for my medical degree. Um, I went on to St. Barnabas Hospital in the Bronx for my four-year residency, which I am certified in medicine and surgery. Thank you, Dr. Adams. So before we begin this robust conversation, I want you all to just take 10 seconds and just imagine if you had no feet. Just imagine if you lost some of your digits, how would that impact your life? It would tremendously change your life. But yet still, we don't take care of our feet. Our feet are the most neglected part of our body. So our job today is to educate you and make you start having a more mental shift as to what you can do and how you can preserve your feet moving forward. So that's where podiatry comes in. A lot of you don't know what podiatry is, what we do, and our scope of practice. So a podiatrist is a, medic is a doctor uh, that specializes in the foot, ankle, and lower extremity. We have a large scope of area where we practice and a lot of things that we do. So I'm just gonna go over a few of the things as podiatrists that we see in our clinic on a daily basis. Uh, we do a lot of wound care, a lot of ulcerations. So that's, we cover wound care. Uh, we see athletes, so we do sports medicine. If you're a runner and you have a lot of issues with your feet, uh, we take care of that too. We do a lot of dermatological lesions. You have mass in your feet, you have open wounds. Uh, podiatrists, we take care of that. We see a lot of kids in our practice. So our practice varies from young children to the very elderly. So we do that also. A tremendous amount of the care we do in our practice is devoted to diabetic foot care. Uh, we're very, very much um, in contact with a lot of diabetics, so if that's relevant to you, you must see a podiatrist and you must see a podiatrist on a regular basis. Uh, we do geriatrics, and um, another part of our practice that we do a tremendous amount of care is we do a lot of surgery, a lot of forefoot and rear foot surgery. So as you can see, as a podiatrist, our scope is varied and we do a lot of things, so that's what podiatry is all about. 
So today we're going to discuss the five most common foot problems we see in office. Fungus in athlete's foot, ingrown toenails, heel pain, specifically plantar fasciitis, flat foot, and the diabetic foot. So one of the first pathologies that I'm going to be discussing this morning, something that's very common that I see on a regular basis, is fungal toenails. I like to say that the picture is worth a thousand words. If you look at the picture up in the screen, you know that's not normal. Your finger, your toenails are supposed to be translucent. When you look at it, you're supposed to see all the way through. You're not able to do that in this picture. So uh, basically, fungal toenail is a condition that causes a nail to be thick, discolored, and brittle. And in some cases, when it becomes very severe, it is painful. So that is an example of what an abnormal toenail would look like. So if you have a to toenail that looks like this, it's most likely fungus in the toenails, okay? Uh, how do we treat fungus? We have a lot of things, a lot of ways of treating fungus. Uh, we can uh, prescribe topical antibiotic cream, which would be something like naphtin or ketoconazole. We usually prescribe uh, oral antifungal in the case of like Lamisil, and in other cases we are able to do laser treatments. So if you look at the picture um, on the left, that's before uh, fungal treatment, and the one on the right is after. So you're able to clearly see what uh, normal looks like and what an abnormality will look like. So that is fungal toenails. Okay, so now we're going to discuss the athlete's foot. Athlete's foot is a skin condition, a fungal skin condition, that mainly occurs in sweaty feet while wearing tight-fitted shoes. Some symptoms will be itching, chafing, rash, scaling, or burning. So here in this picture, you'll see an example of an athlete's foot. You can appreciate the scaling and the rash-like lesions. How do we treat athlete's foot similar to toenail fungus? We have topical antifungals like ketoconazole, oral antifungal like Lamisil or terbinafine, antibiotics like erythromycin, and topical steroids like hydrocortisone. So some self-care practices to prevent getting athlete's foot, you want to keep the feet dry, especially after showers and after exercise. You want to also avoid tight-fitting shoes and also avoid walking barefoot indoors as well as outdoors. Another common condition that I see on a daily basis on my practice is ingrown toenail. If you look at the picture above, you can obviously see that this is not a normal toenail. Uh, ingrown toenail is a condition where the nail grows into the skin, causing pain, swelling, redness, and sometimes infection. If you see this at home, I don't care how many home remedies you decide to do, it will not work. You're only going to make it worse, and when you come to the office, you just make us do a lot more work. So if you see your toenails looking like this, it's ingrown, and you have to come to podiatrist so we can take care of the problem. Now, what causes ingrown toenails? Uh, there is a myriad of causes. Uh, if you're wearing the wrong size shoe, you can cause a problem. Uh, sometimes when you cut the toenails, if you're not cutting it correctly, and you leave a little spicule under the nail, that will also cause um, ingrown toenail. <clears throat> uh, broken toenails, that's also another cause. And what I see a lot in my practice is um, people that have gone and gotten pedicure. And when you get a pedicure done, it's done incorrectly, the nail is not cut properly, and then they come into the office and they're in a lot of discomfort. So these are some of the reasons that oh, you can also have ingrown toenail. And one other thing I forgot to mention, there's also a genetic uh, predisposition to ingrown toenail. So that's also what we see. So how do we treat ingrown toenails? We have uh, several ways of treating it. We can use oral uh, anti-inflammatory medication, example, Aleve and ibuprofen. Uh, we can also use antibiotic cream like bacitracin. And in some other cases where the conservative treatments are not effective, we, can, we also can do surgery. We can do a partial nail avulsion, which is just basically just removing a, a small section of the toenail. Or if it's very advanced stage, we do what's called a total nail avulsion. 
we remove the entire nail. So I just want to bring this home. If you have something that looks like this, please do not try to take care of it at home. You need to seek uh, a podiatric here. So now we're going to discuss heel pain. Heel pain has several different diagnoses. Some are plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, bone tumor, bursitis, Haglund's deformity, a heel spur, uh, peripheral neuropathy, sarcoidosis, rheumatoid arthritis, just to name a few. But for the sake of today's presentation, we're going to focus on plantar fasciitis because it's the most common disorder we see in office. So plantar fasciitis. Plantar fasciitis is the inflammation of the plantar fascia ligament that connects the heel bone to the toes, which causes heel pain. The plantar fascia is responsible for supporting the arch of the foot and absorbing shock when walking. What are some symptoms of plantar fasciitis? Heel pain when you first awaken in the morning and you start to get out of bed. Heel pain when standing after long periods of sitting. Heel pain after exercising, swelling, and stiffness. Risk factors, on average, ages 40 to 60. However, we do see presentation in much younger folks and older individuals as well. Long distance running, ballet dancing, um, if you have a flat foot or high arch, if you are obese, um, jobs that keep you on your feet, like factory workers, teachers, nurses, to name a few. How do we diagnose? So usually and when you come in the office, we do a very thorough clinical evaluation. And from there, we can definitely pinpoint what plantar fasciitis is. Uh, we also have x-rays, where sometimes it presents as a heel spur noted on this x-ray right here. Um, we can also do an ultrasound evaluation, which shows inflammation of the ligament. So how do we treat plantar fasciitis? Again, we can use anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen and Aleve, physical therapy, bracing like night splints, orthotics like you see here, and we can also do customized orthotics in office, uh, corticosteroid injections, shockwave therapy, and of course, if all else fails after a six month period, we can go on to surgery. Okay, so the next thing that we also see and treat a lot in the office is flat feet. If you take a look at that picture, you're obviously going to note that that is not a normal foot. Uh, the medial aspect of the foot is completely in contact with the floor. Uh, a, normal, a normal foot would have an arch, a minor arch in, in the medial aspect, and that is lacking here in this picture. So what is flat foot, which is also known as pest planus, is a condition where there is a lack of arch in the sole of the feet. Okay. Uh, another picture from the back, you can see looking from the back of the foot how the foot is immediately collapsing onto the floor, and that's also an indication of um, that you have flat feet. So some of the things that cause flat feet are aging, uh, wearing the wrong type of shoes, uh, family history, if you have an injury that can also make you prone for flat feet, arthritis, and most importantly, if you're overweight, then it causes flat feet because then you, um, the arches are collapsing inward. So flat feet also can cause a lot of discomfort. Um, what happens with typical flat feet, you'll have a lot of heel pain. Uh, you can have Achilles pain that's in the back of your Achilles tendon. Uh, you can have bunion pain. You can have ankle, knee, and hip pain. Uh, but most significantly, flat foot, flat feet is a major problem. It affects all aspects of your life. So that's another example of flat foot, uh, your flat feet on the right side. And how do we treat flat feet? We do a combination of therapy. We can do ice and stretching. We can also prescribe non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. We can dispense orthotics, which goes in the shoes and pretty much um, increase the arch in the bottom of your feet. Uh, we recommend that you change your footwear. And um, if all else fails, then we can do surgery. We can do flat foot reconstructive surgery, which is very extensive. So the idea is to try and prevent all of this before it happens. Uh, there's a picture, the next picture, that shows on the left-hand side, which is an obvious flat foot, and on the right-hand side, that's post-surgery cor correction 
So as you can see, now there's a little arch in the bottom of the foot. So um, I just want to bring home the fact that um, flat feet are a problem. I see it a lot in our community, African-American community, and it's not something that should be taken lightly because if it goes untreated, it's quite progressive and it can really alter your quality of life. So now we're going to talk about the diabetic foot. And I know a lot of people can relate to this disease or know someone that has diabetes, so what is it? Diabetes is a disease which the blood glucose sugar levels are very high. Um, the body needs glucose for energy. And typically the cells, the, horm the hormone insulin will regulate how much glucose is, is, is used by our body. For example, if you have type one, Diabetes, your body does not make insulin enough. And type two, the insulin is just imbalanced, is an off. <clears throat> so what are symptoms for diabetes? As we can see by this little cartoon, um, always tired, frequent urination, sudden weight loss, wounds that won't heal, sexual problems, um, increased hunger, blurry vision, increased thirst, vaginal infections, and last but not least, numbness and tingling in your feet. How does diabetes cause foot problems? So diabetes can create a lot of foot problems. Poor circulation is one. Um, diabetic neuropathy, when you have numbness and tingling in your feet, that's called neuropathy. Infection, which can lead to an ulcer. It can lead to gangrene, as seen in this photo right here. Um, a bone infection, amputation, and charcoal foot. So this is an example of a charcoal foot, or we also call it charcoal arthropathy, which is a progressive degenerative condition which results in the weakening of the bones and the soft tissue in the foot and the ankle. Um, your foot will go numb and will not be noticeable until it manifests in your foot. So your circulation is impaired, your nervous system in your foot is impaired, and this can lead to charcoal. This is a wound um, that I treated. Uh, this person was a diabetic. As you can see on the left, presented in February with this wound, and through weekly wound care, we were able to close the wound by November. Diabetes can also lead to swelling in the feet um, because the circulation is affected. Um, it's not being drainage, the pooling of water in the foot is common and it's not being drained as it should. So what happens is you'll get edema or swelling in the feet. Um, diabetes can also lead to calluses, which are bony prominent areas of pressure. Um, and also on the right side, you can see that this person had an infection, which led to amputation of some toes. So how can I protect my feet if I have diabetes? You want to, one, check your feet every day, multiple times a day. You want to, of course, wash your feet every day. You want to visit us or a podiatrist every two months for an evaluation. You want to wear well-fitting shoes and socks. You want to protect your feet from heat and cold. And you also want to maintain good blood flow to their feet. So we're now going to shift gear a little and mention, talk a little about some of the surgical procedures that we do as podiatrists. So um, podiatry, as a scope of medicine, we have a lot of clinical medicine we do, but we also do a lot of surgery. So some of the things, uh, surgical procedures that we treat on a regular basis would be, uh, we discuss uh, hammer toe correction. If you have a bunion, we do bunion surgery. Uh, we also do a lot of soft tissue mass removal. Uh, I mentioned nail surgery earlier. Uh, we do a fixation of um, fractures. So if you fracture a bone, you can come to podiatrist and we can go in and make sure the bone is fixated and aligned in the correct position. We do four foot reconstruction surgery. We also do tendon repair in a case where you have tendon ruptures. Uh, we do fusions of bones and debridement of skin lesions and ulcer. So as you can see, there's such a plethora of um, things that we do as podiatrists in our office day in and day out. So we're just going to discuss quickly two procedures that we commonly do, and then we're going to open the floor for questions. Uh, hammer toe surgeries. Hammer toes are extremely common. 
Uh, as you can see in the picture on the left hand, I don't know if you can see, yes. On the left hand side, there is a uh, individual with a hammer toe. In this case, the hammer toe is uh, second toe is overlapping the first toe, and there's also a bunion deformity uh, that's in the picture. So a toe that is abnormally bent um, is usually considered a hammer toe, and it usually affects the second and the third toe. So it's really an imbalance of the muscle tendons or ligaments that normally holds the toe straight together. So what are some of the treatments or ways that we can alleviate hammer toes? We can do what we call conservative treatments primarily, and if that doesn't work, we do surgical correction. So we can um, advocate using uh, separators for the toes. If you have a dorsal corn on top of your second or, or third toe, we can um, recommend padding. If you're having some discomfort, we can prescribe non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. We can also splint and strap the toe, anything that's gonna try and straighten the toe. Orthotics for uh, the shoes to um, lift up the arch. And if all fails, then we have um, hammer toe correct, corrective surgery. So the picture here, we have two pictures, one on the left and one on the right. The picture on the left, the plits, uh, hammer toe, the second toe, as you can see, is abnormally longer than the second toe. And you also have a dorsal corn that's present on the toe. On the right-hand side, we did surgery and we corrected the toe, so the, we no longer have the corn on the second toe, and you can see there has been a shortening of the second toe to look a lot more normal uh, where it should be. The picture on the right uh, indicates a person's foot that has a dorsal corn, and uh, we did surgical correction, and as you can see, the corn is no longer there. So now I'm gonna discuss, lastly, the bunion. A bunion is a bony prominence that forms on the joint of the base of the big toe. It occurs when some of the bones in the front part of your foot dislocates, which causes the tip of your big toe to be pulled towards the smaller toes. So sometimes the skin over the bunion might be red, and sore, which causes inflammation. What are some risk factors for bunion? High heels, ill-fitting shoes, rheumatoid arthritis, and lastly, hereditary. There is a genetic predisposition for a bunion. How do we treat bunions? Uh, like this picture shows, is something called a bunion sleeve. It prevents the friction and rubbing against that medial prominence. Changes in footwear, NSAIDs like ibuprofen or Aleve for the pain, corticosteroid injections, which you can get in office, and again, if all else fails over a six-month period, we can talk about bunion corrective surgery or a bunionectomy. So here's examples of before and after of bunion surgery. As you can see on the left side, um, the person has a bunion. And then after surgery, the toe, is, the toe is more aligned and straightened. So I know that we have covered a lot this morning, a lot of information, and I hope that we have accomplished our goal, which is to pretty much demystify what podiatry is and what we do. It's a very extensive field. Um, we, tr we cover and we treat the foot, ankle, and lower extremity. So now that we have done our presentation, we want to hear from you guys if you have any questions, testimonials, you had a podi if you've seen a podiatrist, or if you need to see one, we're available. So we're going to open the floor now up for questions and answers. Thank you. So thank you for the presentation. Um, I recently tore my Achilles tendon last October, so I'm currently going through rehab. And a part of the initial recovery, I was told that, um, of course, it's wrapped up, but I couldn't do anything for about two and a half months. If I had to take a shower, I had to wrap it up. You know, I couldn't take it, take it off. So after the first the initial recovery, 
and my post-operation appointment, the doctor unwrapped it. And of course, you know, water hasn't contacted. It's, you know, it smells, it's not, it's not good to see. So um, now that I'm in my recovery process, it's, uh, it's much better, but I'm experiencing like sharp pains in my heel. I'm attributing that to it's still recovering, but sometimes I'll get sharp pains in my toes or my feet. So I'm just, is there anything at home that I can do to alleviate that? Yes, so um, just to be clear, you had surgery, correct? Yes, yeah. Okay. Did you do any form of physical therapy? Currently, two days a week. Okay. Yeah. Good. So physical therapy is very important for you. You have to kind of regain that strength in the Achilles tendon. Mm -hmm. And um, they should also send you home with home exercises. Right. What I would suggest is like getting a resistance band or a towel, and you want to kind of like pull the foot back and forth just so that tendon can get some kind of um, blood flow, right. as you can say. Right. Um, with Achilles tendon, it takes a while. It takes a, lo a while to recover fully. Um, chances are you may not go back to how you was pre-injury, but exercising, physical therapy is very, very important. Also wearing shoes with a little heel lift. Um, you want like an orthotic that can give you a heel lift in your sneakers so that you can take that pressure off when you're walking. Uh, just to add to what Dr. Adams said, I concur with everything she said, but most importantly, I think if you don't have orthotics, uh, please look into getting a custom-made orthotics, not the one over the counter. You need to, you need to be fitted correctly. What was that, custom-made? Orthotics, orthotics. So you need to you know, have your feet evaluated, and that would help tremendously. Thank you. Thank you for the question. You're welcome. Doctor? <laughs> Sorry. So we have a question from Facebook. Um, Margarita asks, what causes your feet to be darker than your legs? Uh, well, I'm not sure how old she is, but usually sometimes what happens is if there's poor circulation, uh, that's one of the biggest causes. You have a discoloration of lower extremity closer to your feet and ascending up to the leg. So um, assuming, as I said, she didn't say how old she was, but we see a lot of discoloration with poor circulation. Anything else? Yeah, definitely, I concur with that. I also, um, people who are in warmer climates too, when you get, please do also know that you tan on your feet easily, mm -hmm. so that is, can be contributed to the darker foot versus the rest of the body. We have an, another question from Facebook from Desiree Hall. Is there a treatment for dark, for thick, dark toenails? That sounds to me like, <clears throat> like the picture I showed earlier, it may have some fungus in the toenail, and um, so you have to have that looked by a podiatrist. Uh, most times, you know, we try to do home remedies. Once the fungus gets under the nail, it's not gonna work. All the soakings and whatever else I hear of, the home concoctions, it doesn't work. So you would need to have a doctor evaluate it. Like I was saying, I don't have a question, but I do have a testimonial. Um, so in April, I had foot surgery to remove a ganglion cyst, which was it's kind of large. And um, during that process, I thought it was just gonna be a simple recovery, as I was told. Turned out that I developed some complications, which turned into, I wasn't quite sure what it was at the time, except for that I was told that I needed a second surgery. I switched jobs, so then my insurance switched, so the persons that operated on me could no longer treat me because they didn't take my insurance. So I was stuck literally with a hole in my foot and my foot was leaking like profusely, like really leaking a lot. Um, so I contacted my insurance provider and I literally went through like a list of podiatrists and happened to walk into Dr. Monica's office in Dr. Sharice's office and I was really saddened because I really didn't know what was going on. Um, so I met Dr. Monica at first, and she was very welcoming. I didn't think that they were gonna treat me because I had gone somewhere else and they told me to go back to where I came from. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So anyway, um, I learned that I had what I thought was a hole, turned out to be a, an ulcer. And 
I was being told that, oh, we just need to have surgery to remove the sutras and to close the womb. I was further educated that that was not possible. And I was just like, okay, <laughs> wait, I thought an ulcer was something you had in your stomach. Long story short, um, Dr. Monica and Dr. Adams, I was a little bit resistant and I had some control issues because <laughs> I didn't want infection. And also I just thought I needed a surgery. So I was bent on a surgery. But they um, administered a different um, treatment method um, with, uh, actually they use a, a gel called Regranix and uh, what was it? Oxygen therapy through a womb vac, which I was still a little skeptical about. But um, so from June to August, I was still leaking still using the Regranix, and eventually um, the womb actually closed. So I do want to just thank you guys. It was a long process. <laughs> thank you. And they really didn't know me, like I said, and a lot of people did not want to treat me. And also, my insurance, one more thing, my insurance did not cover some of the treatment, and they really made it possible for me to have the treatment without actually paying for it. So I do want to really thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you, Keisha, for that testimony. Can I just say one thing before the next question? What I learned from Keisha's treatment is that we need to advocate for our care. I'm going to say that again. This is your body, and you have to advocate for your care. When she came into the office, she asked a lot of questions. She did her research. It's not just what I said. She had what I said, but she also had her questions also. So once again, I'm saying this to you, please be the person that advocate for your self-care. Do your homework. And when you come to see the doctor, know what your options are, not whatever we say blindly, you take it. So Keisha, I'm so happy you're doing much better. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm, my name is Gloria. Recently, uh, about two weeks ago, I came to church went home and through the course of the day, my foot just swelled. Well, I have poor circulation in my legs. Well, my cardiology keeps a track of that. So my question is, by the foot swelling up like that, do you think anything had to do with the blood flow? Because it just came up, I, I couldn't walk for two weeks. The leg, the ankle, everything that swelled up out of the blue. Bad me, I didn't go to the doctor, I just soaked it. Blah, blah, blah. Do I do have a podiatrist, but I don't run to the doctor for every little thing if I can handle it. But I literally could not walk almost for two weeks because of the back of the ankle. So, you know, I was just speculating is it from the blood flow, from the leg? You know, wasn't any blood sitting down there. So, what do you think that could have been? Yeah, so it could be attributed to a vascular problem or circulation issue. Okay. Um, it could also be attributed to arthritis. Sometimes if we have arthritis, we get it in our ankle joints, our knees, our hips. They become inflamed, swollen, edematous, especially after a long day. So it would be best to look into talking to your podiatrist so they can do a thorough eval. The good thing about our office is that we have a vascular doctors in office Mondays and Fridays. They do a thorough exam of circulation to your feet, and then they will recommend um, what their advice would be going forward for that. I appreciate you telling me that, but I see a cardiologist and he does all that kind of test. He does, he tests my vascular as well. I will keep you all in mind, you know. Yeah. Uh, don't forget your diet. Sodium has oh, yeah. a lot to do with retention of uh, fluid in the lower extremity. Uh -huh. So watch the salt. I do not advocate the white salt, which we're used to using our diet. Eliminate that and also, oh, yeah. you know, check your diet amount other things, okay? And I'm a borderline diabetic, so I, I do mine with a diet. I don't, thank God I'm not on medicine, so I control the very one. My AC1 uh, was 6.1, so still borderline, but I do treat it like I have it. I do the right thing. Okay. But I do see a podiatrist, you know, every three months and... But I'm going to keep you all in mind, you know, you it's know, okay. a second <laughs> opinion. Long, yeah. Yes, and yeah. also, if you're eating out a lot, that's, you're not sure what they're putting into, you know, the ingredients as far as the salt. Uh -huh. So just be, be mindful oh, yeah. of that I, also. I watch it all that, yeah. <laughs> okay. I love it all, but it don't love me. Thanks for your question. <laughs> Somebody else. 
Okay, so we have a question from Zoom. Um, does knee pain going up and down stairs result from foot issues? That's a hard question to, uh, that's, that's hard to decipher. So knee pain, again, sounds like a little bit of arthritis. Um, can foot issues contribute to knee pain? Of course. Can knee pain contribute to foot issues? Of course. Our body is kind of in sync with one another, so if one thing is hurtful or in pain, they will depend on the other joint or the other side. Like I see patients sometimes, their left side, their left foot hurts, so you're walking a certain way, which contributes to your right side eventually hurting. So yes, it is possible that it can be linked, but x-rays and an evaluation with a doctor would help. Okay, my question is, um, first of all, I'm a diabetic. What I notice is that blisters keep coming up on my foot. Is there a reason for that? Okay, so blisters, we have to do a comprehensive exam. The first thing I ask patients, I look and see uh, what kind of shoes are they wearing. Uh, as a diabetic, I always recommend to get a diabetic shoes. I know now they're a lot more fashionable than before. Okay, so we can look at the shoe wear. I also look and see if the, the, the way you're walking, if you probably need some insoles. Uh, to rebalance the way you're walking. So we do a very comprehensive evaluation for diabetics. We check the circulation. Uh, there may be areas of your foot where you um, predispose to more pressure in that area. So we look at that to see where there's pressure going on in the feet. So as I said, it's very comprehensive that we take a look from here down to see what's going on. But the first thing I would always say is footwear. Mm -hmm. Okay? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah, hello. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, one of the things I learned um, as growing up, I used to like those fancy shoes with a pointed toe. So when I came here, I was still wearing them. <laughs> and I had started having bunion, and I had to, the doctor was treating, and then I had to end up at surgery on both feet. And then after the surgery, I was still wearing those nice fancy shoes, pointed toe. And my doctor said, no, no, Mr. Stewart, they got to change your shoes wear. So I had, to, I had to change my whole wardrobe of shoes. So I had to start, I had to give away all my shoes, my nice pointy toe shoes, I have to give them away. So, and after that, I started wearing the shoes that the doctor told me to wear, which I didn't like. Because <laughs> so I like those nice fancy shoes, pointy toe. So I stopped buying those and my foot started to get better. And thank God for that. I'm doing much better now with the foot, but my ankle, I felt so hard. The doctor said I end up injured the back of my my. So I had to get needles. And those needles are no joke. There's some pain getting those needles. So um, I thank God for that. But with my with my nails, I used to go to do my nails, and when they you know they clean it, I start getting darker on here, and I show it to my doctor. So what I what I discovered, they weren't um, sterilizing those things because years yes. ago in the city. And yeah. um, this health department used to go around to those nail shop and check to m make sure they sterilizing those things that they used to do your nails. And I start bringing my own stuff when I go to, you know, do my nails. And thank God, everything is good now. So, so ladies, please, when you go to those nail saloon, make sure they sterilizing those things before they do your nails. Because as they finish with one person, <laughs> they use it to you and they're not sterilized. So be careful when you go to do your nails. Uh, Unfortunately, um, the nail salon keeps our office very, very busy. <laughs> Especially in the summertime, oh my gosh, I cannot tell you the number of ingrown toenails I see, uh, mycotic nails, fungus in the skin, it's a mess. So all I can tell you to be very cautious now, uh, since COVID, they're using the plastic liners to put in the Whirlpool you cannot sterilize a whirlpool. In the past, they would clean it, and then next thing you know, you put your feet in there, the jets are on, and the debris is back in the water. So moving forward, one, make sure you always have a liner in the whirlpool before you do your pedicure. 
If you are able to take your own instruments, then that's always a good thing to do. And another thing that we don't think about is a nail polish. How many toenails are being done from that one bottle of nail polish? Think about it, we don't think about it, okay? So if you're able to and you can, take your own nail polish. I mean, I don't, but that's something I'm gonna start doing because it is a, a haven of a lot of fungus. So be cognizant, be aware, knowledge is power. So we're gonna be empowered here, thank you. Ready? Okay. Um, this is Debbie from Facebook. My 16-year-old granddaughter has a mass in her arch and complain of pain more often now than before. She has been under the care of a pediatric orthopedic surgeons in the past. What's your thoughts? That sounds like plantar fibroma, which is associated with what I talked about, plantar fasciitis. So plantar fasciitis can also present itself with a soft tissue mass in the arch due to the fibroma. So what I suggest is that she see a podiatrist. Um, we can do x-rays, we can do an ultrasound, clinical evaluation. Um, then from there, we can talk about orthotics, we can talk about maybe injections. We'll make the, the mass a little smaller and shrink it. Um, but the main issue, the, the main um, treatment for her will be offloading that area with orthotics, with padding, um, and eventually she'll get some pain relief. Uh, also something to note as far as knowledge, you have to know when you're gonna see an orthopedic doctor or a, or a podiatrist, okay? We see in my 30 years of practice, I don't know how many feet I've seen, okay? So we see a lot of feet when it comes to foot problem, there's nothing that we don't know how to treat. So something like that, you would see a podiatrist, not an orthopedic doctor, just for knowledge's sake. Just a quick question. Um, I think that most of us don't think about this, but I'm thinking about it because it's a habit that we all do. Can it cause any damage in the future if we do the crossing of the legs or keeping your legs on top of each other up for long periods of time? Can that extend something in the possible future that, you know, it cause any damage to your legs or circulations, anything like that? Yes. Um, actually, I saw a patient maybe a couple months ago um, as a child was always crossing while doing homework. That's how she was. And they attributed to some knee pain as well as some foot pain. So yes, you have to be mindful of the things that you do. It will kind of catch up to you. Yeah. Um, so I know it's a habit, but breaking that habit little by little will be beneficial for sure. Especially we ladies like to think we look sexy when we cross our legs. You're compressing the artery and the circulation. So <laughs> keep your legs down, cross it at the ankle, but gently, but that's not a good habit to have. Just okay. one more. Um, I, um, I do work out in the gym and I do legs a lot. Um, do you have any uh, suggestions on shoe wear to when you lift lifting heavy? Um, because I know most sneakers are not fit for everything. Yes. Um, when you're lifting heavy weights, and I had a conversation this week with a, uh, with a patient, um, you have to, it's best to be flat-footed. Some people suggest even no sneakers at all, because the pressure you're going to put on your forefoot, the sneaker is not going to be beneficial for you. So when you're lifting heavy in the gym, it's best to be flat as possible or without a sneaker. But of course, when you're, you know, doing your uh, cardio and everything, you should also be, be in a good supportive sneaker with arch support. Thank you. You're welcome. That's my son, and why I'm doing that because I'm always in the bed with my feet. Oh, he asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for the lovely presentation today. Um, as, a, as a former athlete, I was a high jumper, a long jumper, and so mm. forth. Nobody would think that I, that I did all that. However, um, however, um, my coach had told me that when I got older, my hips, because the way how I would, uh, I had a different way of jump, high jumping and so forth, it would affect me. And it is, in a sense. Um, so the pain would be around there because I used my left in, in the way how I jump, you know, mm high -hmm. jump. And uh, um, then it went down to my knee, mm -hmm. and sometimes it would 
crossed my ankle. Um, but I went to a therapist and I got, they gave me uh, instructions how to take care of that. All right, the other thing um, I looked, I have flat feet. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I have to be wearing special type of shoes, etc. Okay. Expensive, but it's my, my um, thing. Um, in the future, I mean, as you get older, I understood, as you said, it would um, still affect you and mm -hmm. so forth. So going forward, um, you, is there anything else that you could share with me, or uh, anyone who has flat feet, you know, what can be done in order to, you know, to really, because sometimes I feel the pain still, you know. Do you have custom orthotics that are made for you? Custom orthotics, were those uh, fabricated for you as yet? No, no, okay. no. So that's one of the... And the other thing is that I want to find the insurances you take. Okay, we can discuss that okay. after, okay? okay. But Thank we you take very much. almost everything. Thank <laughs> and, you very much. and insurance should not deter you from coming to see me because you guys are now VIP and my <laughs> office is open to any one of you that needs care. So don't, we're not, we don't treat insurance, well, we well, treat the patient. Okay. <laughs> I okay, so don't I, worry about insurance, we will I work with you. I come to course because I'm in that line. Professional oh. accountant, so. Okay, okay, but don't worry about that. You're in good care. You're in good hands. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chris. I just want to give a slight testimony because I've been having a lot of knee problems. My knee's been swollen. I went on, to, on vacation. I had knee, my knee was swollen. I came back and I met Dr. Joseph and I told her, she, I said, are you a knee doctor? She said, I do everything come see me, and I went. And I have two visits with her so far. And so she gave me something to rub on my knee. I don't know what is in it, but it's working. <laughs> I could walk up the stairs now, and also I was, she diagnosed me, I did have flat feet, yeah. and that's what was causing the, the pressure problem. on my knee that I couldn't walk properly, and I'm being fitted for the orthotics. orthotics. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. But I just want to say thank you, because it's been really helping me. The ointment that she gave, it's been really helping my knee. For a long time, today is the first time that I felt a pain, and it could be because of the cold weather. So I just want to say thank you again. <laughs> You're welcome, Chris. Chris was so funny, she came to the office, she says, I don't know what's in that cream. I need more, and I'm now my mother is using it, and I'm giving it to everyone. I'm, I said, Chris, that's for you. Let your mom come, and I'll treat everyone. But uh, uh, I just want to point out one other thing. Uh, I think I mentioned it earlier that there is such a connection between your foot, your ankle, your hip, your lower back. So a lot of times when, when patients come in and say, my knee hurts, I said, okay, take the shoes off, I want you to stand, and I want you to walk. And as I watch a patient walk, I can tell so much about them because the body is not isolated. One thing affects the other, so affects the other. Uh, hip pain can start by just the way you're, you're walking and how your feet are. So don't just say, you know, I have, I'm having knee pain and it's a podiatrist and they can't treat me. We see a lot of feet and everything is connected. So don't forget that. Yeah, there's a bunch of questions on Facebook. Um, one of them is, what's the difference between a podiatrist and an orthopedist? So there is a big difference, um, but some similarities. So a podiatrist, we are a foot and ankle medical professional, doctor, and surgeon, okay? A orthopedist is, they are foot and ankle also. Orthopedists that only surgically treat the foot and ankle, meaning if you have a fracture, if you have a bunion, they are surgically trained alone. So us, as medical professionals of the foot and ankle, again, we treat the diabetic foot, we treat dermatology, we treat wounds, we treat ulcers, uh, various amount of skin conditions and medical problems. An orthopedist cannot and will not do that. We're also trained in biomechanics, which is the way your body walks and functionality of your foot with your body an orthopedist is not trained in that. So that is a key difference. And also our scope is a little different. Uh, podiatrist, foot and ankle exclusively, orthopedic, shoulders, hip, knees, we don't do that. So we're just pretty much isolated to the very lower extremity of the body. 
Um, one other question from Anna on Facebook. What causes bunions, and is there a non-surgical treatment for it? What ca causes bunions, and is there a non-surgical treatment? So um, again, like we mentioned, bunions are caused by ill-fitting shoes, genetic predisposition, which is probably the top main cause, um, wearing high heels, and non-surgically, bunion sleeves, orthotics, wider shoe wear, that's, that's how you treat bunion non-surgically. And I always say to a patient, um, there is such thing as lineage, you know, look at what your parents' feet look like. It tells you a lot about your feet. Bunions are hereditary. Uh, flat feet are hereditary. So this is not isolated. So if you see your parents' toes are curling up like this, most likely in time, yours will look like that. So it's very, it has a very high genetic component. And one last question from um, Facebook. How do I select a good all-around sneaker? One for a beginner runner. That's actually a very good question. Um, we see a lot of patients in the office that are, you know, of course, with COVID being home for two years, now they want to, they COVID wait, they want to start by exercising and being um, healthier. So I also say, like, make sure it's a wide shoe a wide sneaker, New Balances are a good brand, Asics are a great brand, especially for a beginner runner. Um, more pricier, Brooks Running, Hoka's, Skechers are also very good. So those are the brands I recommend. If I had to say top three will be Asics, New Balances, and Skechers. Okay, so uh, it's time for us to wrap it up. I'm getting a look from um, Chief in the back, <laughs> <laughs> who is very cognizant of time. So the biggest takeaway today is that um, your feet are important. As I started this lecture by saying, just imagine if you didn't have your feet. What would your life be like? It would not be a life that you would want. So be an advocate for your feet. Know that we are available. You don't have to come to us, but I have two locations here in Brooklyn, very convenient. I have a 24 hours answering service. We always get back to you. We take uh, almost every insurance. So start taking care of your feet and it would take you a very long way into your life. Thank you very much for being part Thank of you. the panel. Come on, a big hand please for our doctors. A big, uh, grateful, so grateful, so grateful uh, for their presentation. Uh, I hope you've all learned something today that's gonna be uh, enable us to be much more responsible uh, with the feet God has blessed us with and uh, we can reduce the amount of Epsom salt that you always depend on. Everything for people is Epsom salt. Soak those feet in Epsom salt. That's the answer, just like the beer rum is for the head. Uh, and, and teach you all, that's the answer uh, for my, most of us. So we are grateful for the wisdom for these two doctors. They're going to be available afterwards. You can come and talk to them individually about your own personal bunions and corns and so forth, so see my afterwards uh, here. I want to thank Sister Christine. She has been a, a marvelous, marvelous leader that will help ministry, and she's going to have some closing remarks, then we're going to close out in prayer, and then you can come and have a conversation with our doctors. Thank you, Bedford Central. Thank you, Facebook, Zoom. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Dr. Joseph, Dr. Abrams, thank you so much. Adams, Adams Dr. Adams, sorry. Thank you very much. You guys were fantastic. The questions were great. Um, please, start taking care of your feet. They have cards. <laughs> Get their business cards. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, for those who are watching, there's a great phrase. I believe so much in phrases, as I heard from my preaching all the time, that this office is not about insurance, it's about people. That was powerful. So it's not about uh, insurance, it's about people. It's a people-oriented office, so they are more than willing to accommodate. Let's pray together, then you can see Kendra. God, we thank you and honor you. We bless your name for this marvelous, marvelous inspiration. Thank you for the responsibility and accountability we have now to be responsible for the feed that you have given to us. We pray uh, that you may continue to bless this office, bless each one gathered here. Help us always to be a conduit to reach other people about the importance of this body you have given to us. May your grace and peace be with us now. In Christ's name we pray, amen. They have some gifts also they want to share with you. They brought some special gifts. You can also get a gift before you go. Have a great evening, those who are watching. Uh, great to see you, great to see you. Have a great evening, those who are watching. Thank you.